an organisation that's being sincere about its values, they have to ask themselves questions of what limiting values are being reinforced within our organisation by our systems and processes. Hi, I'm Stephen Barkley, Director of Global Business at Flintrock Consulting. For over 25 years, I've been working with values and how they influence our lives. In this OWL Insights series on working with values, I bring you conversations on values with thought leaders from around the world. Let's dive in. Welcome and welcome to this series on working with values and to my special guest today, uh, Neil Hawkes. Welcome, Neil. Thank you very much, Stephen. I'm really pleased to join you today. Thank you. Thanks. And uh, to everyone, Neil is a, is a thought leader in the world of um, international thought leader in the world of values-based education. Um, longtime friend of mine for the last 25 years um, and is really well respected for um, his thinking and his contribution in all areas of uh, working with values. And, and so we wanted to just... Um, to, to get into uh, Neil's grey matter and really pull out some of his jewels, his jewels of wisdom, all in the area of values. And, and so thanks for taking up the challenge, uh, Neil. And the first question I wanted to ask you, it's, it's a basic question, is what are values? Stephen, that's a, a really wonderful question to begin with. Um, it's one of the questions that when I'm giving, uh, sharing my ideas with groups, it's one of the questions I always ask the group. I say, I'm going to give you two minutes. Will you just think about what a value is and then share it, your thoughts with the person sitting next to you? And so often, particularly with um, adults, um, there's a sort of unease in the room. You can ask all sorts of questions. Asking people what a value is. The word value is something that's bounced around often, but people don't give much time to thinking about it. And then after I've given the two minutes, I invite them to come back to me and, uh, you know, we sh they share. And sometimes you get some very profound answers from people that have obviously done a lot of thinking and other people, their eyes go to the floor because they don't want to have eye contact with you. So I always then follow this by telling a story of um, one day I was <clears throat> visiting a school. And actually, I visited this school last week. Um, but that's another story. Anyway, this particular school is a school where army personnel often send their children, not totally, but it's got a, a lot of army people there because it's near an army base. And uh, I, I was seeing around this school, uh, which is a values-based school, and I went into the reception class. Now, reception in England is four and five-year-olds, uh, that sort of age group. And I went into this uh, class and I, I said, good morning, everybody. It's really lovely to see you this morning. Um, can I ask you a question? And they all looked up at me with their little shining eyes. And I, I said, can you tell me? what a value is and one little girl and I always remember she had glasses and she looked up at me and she said a value is a principle that guides our thinking and behavior and the teacher said wow <laughs> and I thought that was wonderful. Now, that little girl had picked up on the school's mantra. The mantra is, you know, what's a value? A value is a principle that guides our thinking and behavior. And I always tease people down under because I'm not talking about principles as heads of school. This is the other spelling of principle. So you have to unpack that. But it's really interesting, that sort of basic notion of what a value is. It, it guides your thinking and behaviour. It's absolutely crucial. Now, again, last week, I was visiting another school in a county called Herefordshire in England. And there's a, a great little school called Madley Primary School, a very creative school. It does a lot of outdoor education at the school. And 
I was auditing the school for our quality mark in values-based education. And I interviewed some children, year six this time, uh, that's 11 year olds. And I said to one girl, I said, oh, um, can you tell me what a value is, please? Now, I cannot do justice to what this child replied to me. Uh, but she didn't give the standard answer. She said, well, and this is a part of what she said. She said, well, it's like a wisp of energy that if I share with the world, then perhaps I halve that energy. And that energy then goes to others so they can use this, this lovely purple color that floats around. And if we could all share that value, then the world would be a peaceful and compassionate place. And I thought, wow. So you went from the concrete to this sort of spiritual understanding of what a value is. And that shows what, if you start children very young, thinking about this, that by the time they're year six, they have, not all children will say that, but they will have a deeper understanding about that. So those are two little stories about what's the value, but mm. it's critical, Stephen, that everybody really thinks about that question and goes inside and really says, well, what do values mean to me? Yeah, thanks. It's a great challenge for everybody to think about what values means to us. And, and I love that little um, story about it being a, a wisp of energy and half of it, um, if just half of it reaches the rest of the world, um, yeah, that what what a lovely answer that she gave. How does that how does that definition around I guess both of them, um, the more official definition around principles that guides our thinking and behaviour and that wisp of energy. How how does that a definition apply in an organisational setting, where you know you you've got maybe a couple of hundred employees, a couple of thousand employees, and they're really trying to be values based. Um, how does that definition apply? Yeah, that's a good question. I've worked with a number of companies and organisations, and uh, and and really explored this. And um, the important factor is that everybody is engaged in thinking about that. So often I, I'm invited to talk in companies, for instance, and the chief executive has done some thinking of values and thinks, oh yes, this is a good thing to have in the company. And they issue a sort of uh, email to everybody saying, well, we're now going to do values. And this is the general definition of values now. I want to see these values working in the organization. And, um, and that misses the point. Um, with values, it's deeply personal, deeply personal. People often don't realize they're deeply personal it is but it's deeply personal and in thinking about what values are it needs a process whereby everybody comes together perhaps in small teams and are given the opportunity to look at that because in coming to answer that question we bring along a lot of our own personal baggage we will have all sorts of Perhaps baggage is not the right word, but um, concepts, ideas based on our backgrounds, our uh, religion that we might belong to, our social group, our ethnicity, our gender. There are all sorts of factors that will play out in a discussion about what values are. So what I'm saying to you, Stephen, is uh, this is a process that should not be rushed. Um, I believe in the school setting, you know, you have a forum in which uh, the community have time to, to really discuss this and, you know, think about what values are and what, what role that they play in our lives. I think what, simply put, what I've grown to understand is that people really don't understand the power of values and the role they play in our lives. 
uh, simply put, the values underpin the choices that we make in life. If we have a value such as respect, and we think, well, how does respect, how do I, how do I work with respect in my life? And that has a profound effect on the choices that I make. Uh, for instance, when looking for a friend, you know, if you come have find someone and they're not showing just basic courtesies and respect, you think, oh, that's not how I am. So they form the choices in our relationships and the people we mix with or not. So they're profound in building our character, um, our personality, which then leads to, of course, um, well, ultimately, the destiny we have in life, the jobs we do, all that sort of thing. So the process, that profound process starts very simply. But one thing I've learned is not to ever um, think that I know more than anybody else in a room. I've, I remember as a very young teacher coming to the conclusion <laughs> that a good percentage of the children in my class were more intelligent than me. <laughs> so if they're more intelligent, then my job is to act as a, uh, to release their creative dynamic, uh, these children, allow them as flowers to grow and blossom and to create the environment that allows that to happen, not to put a lid on their potential, a glass ceiling that doesn't allow them to come up and flourish. Sounds, so that's sounds, the role that so sounds like up. well, it sounds like you're talking about the role of any CEO. I mean, you were just talking about the role of the teacher, um, mm. but the, the same as the role of the CEO. And and what I'm interested in is so what? I mean, what happens if an organisation doesn't talk about the values because as you say, we've all got our values and they're all working and they're influencing. Um, what does it matter if an organisation doesn't have that conversation around values? <clears throat> Simply put, I've used that expression three times now. Um, values, in my way of thinking, fall into two groups. There are enhancing values and there are limiting values. If you have a lot of in limiting values, such as greed, vice, um, jealousy, um, domineering behaviors, all those sort of things. If you have a lot of that, then you have something called cultural entropy. Now, in a company, that cultural entropy will st stop the the growth of the company as an organization, and I'm not meaning the bottom line making profit, but it will stop people actually giving to the organization uh, the potential of what they could give. And it limits, so you have this cultural entropy that actually in the end runs down and the organization goes down. And I've often seen boards replace CEOs because things aren't going well and the the CEO gets thrown out and they think why why have I been moved on and it's because they have just missed some very simple things about values so if you use the the more enhancing values and you make that conscious in an organization not laminated values not oh we're doing values and they go up on the wall but these are living values that are in an organization, then you have uh, people working more effectively together. There's a, a relationship. Uh, I have a daughter that started with a new company this week, and I won't name the company, but she started and she thought, oh, I wonder what my induction is going to be. Well, the first hour and a bit of the induction was um, just having breakfast. And she talked to me later, she said, wow, uh, you know, it wasn't what I was expecting. I thought I was going to get a, a detailed cognitive grilling about some aspect of the company. But it was just an informal breakfast. And then she was shown around the office. Now, this particular company 
Mondays, people are allowed to bring their dogs to work. And so she spent the next hour meeting the dogs in the office. And she began to, began to wonder what's going on here. Now, this is one of the most successful companies in the world that she's now working for. And I thought, wow, this is quite different. This is an organization that is feeling as well as thinking. It's marrying those two. So they, they are motivating their employees to say, you are important to us. We think your well-being is important. We know you will work better in good relationships. And so whoever the CEO is of this company, I'm wanting to congratulate them on creating a really vibrant culture where people do work hard. And this company makes incredible profit too. So mm. they just do it in a different way. So mm. they've thought, what, it, what do values mean to us? Well, it means valuing the person who is our employee. And if we get the best people and we value them, then everything takes off. So you, you talked about cultural entropy. And and so what is, what is the impact if, if, there aren't these conversations around the values, what they look like and what they feel like in terms of cultural ent entropy. So they may have the laminated copy of the values there. So what is the role of talking about values in this equation of cultural entropy? <clears throat> the role is to give a language to give a vocabulary, a language, hmm. which allows people to, to actually discuss lots of things about relationships and, uh, and what they hold dear to themselves or not, and to share that thinking. And what it does, what I've seen it do, is bring people closer together. Um, so that people have a deeper understanding of each other. And talking about values doesn't mean that we're all agreeing. And, you know, because I think healthy disagreement is is really good. I think a touch of cynicism is also good because mm -hmm. it sharpens up thinking. Um, so this isn't about making an organization all uh, lovey and cuddly and uh, 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 that sort of thing. Uh, on the, I think it's the opposite, really. It's a deep respect for human beings comes out of talking about values. And it goes on, <clears throat> really, in the end, to something I discuss, to talk about called self-leadership. What a company needs to do is ensure that everybody who works there is leading themselves. The old-fashioned notion of a company was that you had a hierarchy of people one layer, you know, told the next layer what to do. Everybody reports back to the layer above. And you have this, uh, what I've found in so many companies, you have a middle management that gives uh, a nodding agreement to the values that the, the, the leadership team want. Um, but it's only a nod. When they implement policy to the people inverted commas beneath them then they forget what the company values are because what they're doing all the time is looking for promotion they're wanting to be in the top run so middle management has a lot of tension in it so one of the challenges a company has is actually working with middle management to ensure that the same song is being and it's how they are treated you know uh, I worked for a big international organization in the UK that had a great problem with the middle management. And they said, we don't know what to do, Neil. And so I said, well, quite obvious, really. They don't feel appreciated, wanted, and they've got this feeling that the only way that they're going to get on is by being where you are. Hmm. Uh, it's a difficult one, though, in many ways. I, I guess what I'm, I'm hearing you saying is that the, the role of having these conversations around values is, is the, the shared song, uh, the, the, the shared understanding around what that 
that that value means. So in terms of what's what's some of the the, the skill sets that a that a manager needs or a leader needs within an organization around being a values based leader. Mm. Well, I've got to draw now. I work with a company called Compass for Life. Um, the the person that leads that is a man called Floyd Woodrow. So if you look up Compass for Life on the net, you'll see uh, about our team. And I'm privileged to work with the Compass for Life team. Uh, my role in Compass for Life is to, in organizations, do a deep dive into the values element. Now, if I might briefly explain what Compass of Life for Life does, it, it looks at the compass, very simple model really, but profound. Um, so what a company needs to do first of all is to really ask, well, what's its North Star? You know, with a point in the, that's going north. What's it trying to do? And it needs a roadmap. So you have a roadmap which has a destination. So we all know that destination. So in traditional speak, it's usually put as goals or something that the company is trying to do. Um, so, so you think about what that is. So everybody in the company too is thinking of their North Star. You know, what is it that's you're know, driving your thinking and behavior as well? Um, but it's no good having a North Star unless you have a strategy, which is the south point of the compass. So you're thinking about what are the, the stepping stones that will allow me to get to that? You know, we all have strengths and some, some leaders are very good at the big picture, but they don't think, well, what are the stepping stones that are going to get the company to that point? So you have to think about those, that all the elements of being strategic uh, knowing your personality traits, you know, do a Myers-Briggs on, on yourself and other people so you understand if you're going to be a, a cognitive thinking person or someone who's intuitive. And uh, if, you're, if you have two people in a company and they have strength on either side of those, then they sometimes find communication with each other difficult. So you have to think, well, what do we do? So strategy and is so important and thinking through those issues. Um, then on the West, we have what Floyd calls warrior, and he doesn't mean someone going around with a gun. Um, he means that, uh, you know, thinking back to the, the sort of Eastern masters, as it were, having those qualities um, that enable you. And if you have those qualities, what do you need? So you need to have exercise. You need to have good food. You need to really think about how you maintain your own, own well-being so you can be the sort of person in the company that delivers on, on your North Star. And then you come over to the side that I deal with, which is ethos, ethos. What is your company ethos? Ethos is to do with spirit. It's the spirit or culture of a company that makes it a can-do place or a not. Uh, out of that ethos comes the sort of character, which and character is based on values. I often talk about uh, something that happened to me two years ago when I found myself in hospital because I had a tummy ache. And to cut a long story short, I had an endoscopy. And the this wonderful team of people in the hospital looked after me. And they said at the end, Neil, you're OK. We fixed your ulcer. And I was in awe. And I was in awe of them because of the way they worked as a team. Their North Star was to make sure that I was going to be all right. Uh, they were going to investigate me, etc. cetera. Um, they had all the warrior elements of, uh, they were really jolly. They had the, those dispositions of character. They had their strategy, obviously, for fixing me. And they just had this spirit in the room. You could feel it. You know, I wasn't frightened. It was just great. So having a direction, a compass for life, uh, is really important. And I commend the, the compass principles to any company that's thinking of doing this work. Um, anyway, so 
I don't know if I've answered your question, uh, Stephen, but... Uh... Yeah, I think, I think from, you know, you've had lots of experience with working with leaders, um, particularly in the educational setting and, as you said, organisations. What, what have you noticed in, in just in terms of mindset that sets a values-based leader apart um, from um, somebody that may not be so values-based? Mindset is an interesting concept. Um, I prefer, because mindset is to do with the cognition, how you how you develop your, your thinking. And I think uh, it's much more uh, a way of being. I was working with a colonel the other day and 600 of his troops. And uh, he had invited... Uh, me and a group to to speak and um, he introduced himself and I immediately knew that he was he was a values-based leader uh, the way he engaged with me he looked at me and he was not just a talker but a listener he deeply listened to me you felt when you were talking to him and an energy coming from him that was saying it's okay you had great confidence well i did in him and watching him interacting with troops during the day i could just see his this energy level that he had uh which was had a great deal of humility in it um not the traditional uh army leader that you imagine uh that you imagine years ago probably because they've changed a lot um but th this sort of emanation of being i think is what the values-based leader has and why because they've done a lot of self-work on themselves they haven't just read a lot of books they're not just reading the latest book on leadership and thinking, ah, these are the 10 steps to good leadership. And I'll develop those that mindset that helps me to implement that. That will go some way to helping an organization, but it's not the key. The key is in the quality of being that that person or group of people have. And that's a challenge to any organization. Yeah, so it's, 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 yeah, thank you. And it, it's a, a way of being. And, and there was a few things that you mentioned there that were, I guess, in alignment with the skill set that we were talking about earlier, that in terms of listening um, and a sense of humility um, are the two aspects um, that makes a, a, a values based leader. Um, can you think of any other stories of, of organizations? Um, where that way of being of the leader set them apart um, and help create um, a, a very unique culture. Yeah, again, I, I better not mention the name of the company, but it's an, an international company um, based initially in France, but has spread to the States. I think they may be in Australia too. I'm well, certainly are. They're definitely in the UK. And um, I was invited to talk to their, with, not at, their uh, senior leadership team at a very, very delightful uh, hotel in the Cotswolds in England. For those listeners that don't know the Cotswolds, it's a particularly lovely area of England with rolling hills and very quaint hotels, you know, that were built probably in the 1600s. And this particular hotel I remember turning up to and, and this leadership team was in the room. And immediately you could tell that they were values based. Uh, the way they greeted me, their openness with each other, the level of honesty in the room mm. was incredible. People weren't sycophantic. They were, um, you know, saying what they thought, but in a, in a respectful way that respected the personage of somebody else. They had all those qualities that ensured that whatever I said uh, was going to be absorbed. 
Um, so, you know, I don't know what their uh, process of uh, appointment is, but they obviously have a, a criteria that ensure that uh, people who are very creative, very uh, sensitive, very, uh, very full of of those qualities that allow them to to be with other people like the little girl said it's almost like a wisp of energy mm -hmm. you know what we're understanding i think more and more is is that we haven't understood or used enough what is not seen what is not seen there is an underlying energy that human beings have when they're alive, which I believe is to do with consciousness. I think that we download in some way consciousness from the universe. Einstein was on to this years ago. And when we download this, we have this universal energy that's available to us. But as we grow up in our various cultures and at a, at a point in time and space, which is contextualized, then we use this energy in different ways. And I would think the, the really hope for humanity is that we allow this energy to enable us to be more altruistic, to be more compassionate, to be more open. And if that energy can come from us, then we put it out into the world. And if enough of us put that energy into the world, then we actually affect change at a fundamental level. I wrote a paper, Stephen, um, for the G20 leaders as a part of the V20 values group. And my paper was on how you develop ethical leadership in the world. And it's only by adopting, having this energy <laughs> that I'm talking about, that leaders of the world can actually solve things like climate change, the war in Ukraine. We've got to be, be being in a different way, not just thinking in the old ways. So... Uh... What can organizations do to encourage this this way of being that you're talking about? Um, and because, as you said, that this involves a lot of self work. What mm. what can what can leaders do to encourage this type of culture to develop, where it becomes a way of being? Because this is a whole new level of thinking. Um, what are the what are the practical things that leaders can do to encourage this way of being that you're talking about? A number of organisations that I have uh, worked with in the past, and I'm aware of now, use limiting values, fear is the one that's used most. They will deny it. They'll say, no, there's, the fear isn't here. Uh, but I'm just thinking of certain inspection systems in the world that actually makes sure that fear is endemic in an organization. Mm. And if you have fear, then you're not going to get anything that I'm talking about going on because it limits human behavior tremendously. Fear is really big time in our world at the moment. It, it, it seems to be everywhere. We have and too much fear leads to mental uh, collapse. And, you know, speaking from where I am in the UK, our biggest problem here, and I, I was in Australia just before Christmas, and it's there there in Australia too. Is is well being of people, you know, uh, the teaching profession in Australia feels done to, and 
you know, many people have left. So the teachers have told me in Australia. Uh, it's similar in other places in the world, the United States, the United Kingdom, where fear leads the system. And I'm really heartened in Australia because I was speaking to some government ministers who are determined to shift that mindset. So I've got some hope. So what I'm saying, Stephen, is that just look at certain attitudes, feelings that generate through an organization and ask yourself if you're the leader, do I promote fear or am I helping fear to dissipate? Um, what is it in the structures and routines of my organizations that really need to be looked at. The reporting processes, you know, how we give staff interviews and what those interviews are about for promotion, et cetera. You know, so you're really thinking about and challenging yourself. I think one of the difficult things I found as a leader was actually really standing back from myself and saying, what is it I do unintentionally that stops my organization from growth. I know what I do intentionally, but there are always unintended consequences. And it might be because of an aspect of personality. It might be to do with some hangups that I've got about how I think organizations work. So you've got to be very open. Some listening to me will say, well, Neil, you've got to be careful because you might show weakness. And if you show weakness, then you're undermining confidence in your organization. What I found as a leader, and in all due modesty, I've been studied as a leader. What I know through the studies is that the more you show compassion, humility, but you have the strength of character to to say, right, folks, we've discussed this. Now let's all work together in this direction. Having that strength to say, right, we're going for it then. That's what makes an organization buzz. But the voice of the newest employee is as important as the person who's been there for 20 years. Everybody has an equal voice in a dynamic organization. Well, there's, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, and I, I think that one of the things that you're saying is that organisations say we're, we're, we're talking about our values are about trust and our values are about um, respect. They need to be aware of the limiting values that may be demonstrated by systems and processes. And yeah. that, for an, that for an organisation that's being sincere about its values, they have to ask themselves questions of what limiting values are being reinforced within our organisation by our systems and processes. Spot on, Stephen. Spot yeah. on. Yeah, and and that's that's um that takes a lot of courage, as 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 you said, and um, the self work that you're talking about. How does an organisation go on that journey together? If the self-work is so important, it can't just be one person. How, how does an organisation go on that journey together? Or can they? Make it okay to pause. Mm. Make it okay to pause. If you don't want to use the word pause, okay, call it a brain break. People need permission to have a pause. Um, nice... Again, going back to the army, I was teaching the the troops the other day about how to pause. You know, you think, my gosh, soldiers pausing. That's interesting. Um, but pause, what does this mean? Well, first of all, there may be an issue that you've got to deal with in the day. Perhaps you've got to a stress point in your day. Perhaps you've got a meeting coming up that's you think could be difficult. There are all sorts of circumstances. Uh, you might have just been on a, a fitness run and you're really wound up, wound up and because someone has just been rude to you, so you need to calm down. All sorts of reasons you need a brain break. So what do you do? Well, the first thing is to breathe, to breathe. 
And if, if I was doing a long training on this, I'd teach people how to breathe because most people don't know how to breathe. They do it all the time, but they don't know how to do it. And it's amazing how they don't use the breath properly, ensuring that the diaphragm really goes down, that you put your fingers on your tummy and you can feel your tummy going as you deeply breathe. So give yourself five to 10 deep breaths. And when you've gone through that process, what happens is that your mental stuff starts to slow down a bit and you start to feel calmer. And once you've calmed down, then you've got the first letter of pause, which is peace. You begin to feel a quality of peace. Then when you're in that state of being, then you can go to the next letter, which is A. A stands for attention, awareness. So you give attention to your internal world. What's going on here? How am I feeling? What are my thoughts? Am I, you know, what's happening? So you're looking at that as a, an obs ob observer. You're not sort of going to play at it. You're just saying, oh, that's interesting. I'm feeling rather wound up. So you're aware this. It's an internal scan, like going to the hospital to get a scan, but you're doing it yourself. You're finding out what's going on. And that awareness then allows you to have understanding, which is the third letter. So you have a deep understanding of what's going on inside you, which then leads to the next letter, which is S, which is self-leadership. And in self-leadership, you say, well, if this is going on, what qualities, what values do I need at this moment? You might picture a star, a point of light that's giving you some energy, some value. And this value might be kindness or tolerance or any of the other values. That, that might be what you need. Then you think, what skills do I need too? Is there something in my backpack I need to draw out? You know, oh, I remember I was on a course and that, that skill helped me to actually talk in a more authentic way. So you're really thinking about how you can lead yourself, self-leadership. Now, the outcome of a brain break and pause is what I've termed ethical, um, ethical intelligence. Ethical intelligence is the ability to ethically self-regulate your own behavior. And I think if every company in the world encouraged a simple process, they can adapt what I've just said for their circumstances, their culture, whatever. But if some simple process which helps people to actually check in with themselves. We don't in most societies teach children how to check in with themselves. And I think if we do that, we'd start a quiet revolution of the heart, which would then enable human beings to be and not just do. Mm, beautiful. And so in terms of what organisations can do is helping people, giving them an opportunity to check in with themselves. How have you seen that play out as a practical example in any organisations of how they've enacted pause? Have you got any stories to share? Yes, Werpleston Primary School in the UK started this work. I <clears throat> led a series with my wife, Jane, who's a psychotherapist. We, we did a series of monthly meetings with uh, staff over Zoom, and we taught them elements of pause and backed it up with discussing something called the internal family systems method of psychotherapy. We're not trying to make the staff psychotherapists, but giving them some insights. One of the problems that companies and public organizations suffer from is that they work in silos. 
education always works in education. They don't think of drawing on the expertise of psychotherapy or some other uh, way of thinking. And so we worked with this school and they then worked with pores. And what the head teacher, principal of the school is reporting to me is that it's having a profound effect on children. Uh, it just, you know, and they're also introducing a lot of work on understanding your brain, understanding what your limbic system does. So the children have an understanding and this is also having an effect. I was, I won't name the boy, but uh, a boy with autism it's had an enormous effect on this particular boy's behavior Quite because he, yeah he's now got a tool that when he feels he's getting wound up um he has a um, a ball that he works with so he, he he has to you know move so we don't stop him moving because not everybody can sit like sublimely you know it drives some people mad so this boy has to to work with a, a ball but he, during that process, he does an internal pause. And the teacher says he's less likely now, not totally, because he's got some way to go, but he's less likely to lose it and uh, you know, be overwhelmed. Um, and so that's one little story. Um, but it, I believe that it could have a profound effect. And yeah, I know it's happening in lots of values-based schools now, especially mm. if they read our book, the, the Inner Curriculum, which I do recommend people look at. You, schools and organisations have an external curriculum that they accompany a school. They think, and let's think about, well, this internal curriculum, you know, what is it if I'm the managing director of a big company? What 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 is it? Without losing people, you, so you introduce this stuff gradually and quietly otherwise you you might find big opposition because people would think oh they want us to be whatever so, mm -hmm. so slowly slowly catchy monkey on this one thanks neil uh, for for sharing with us your your jewels of wisdom and 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 honestly there's so much to unpack um, and probably could make an extended long series just out of some of the things that you've talked about today. But there's definitely some some great insights um, and some food for thought for anybody who's trying to think about how to work with values. But and, and this is really a bit of a masterclass because this is not your standard way of working with values. Um, and, and what you've been sharing with us is it's it's a way of being um, and it does require um, inner personal work and requires us to pause. So thanks for joining us um, and, and sharing uh, your, your words of wisdom with us today. It's been great. Thank you very much, Stephen. It's been a joy and a pleasure to be with you again today. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Owl Insights, Working with Values. Please do subscribe to our Owl newsletter and follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. More information about today's speaker can be found in the show notes.